with a zombie. And I walked with Paul McComas. This is part two of Monster Kid Radio's chat with Paul McComas about the classic 1943 film, I Walked with a Zombie. That movie was released 70 years ago. This is the 70th anniversary of what Paul has told me in a private message, one of the most important films of all time. It's an important zombie movie, and it's the movie that we're talking about on this week's episodes of Monster Kid Radio, the podcast devoted to the classic and sometimes not so classic genre cinema of yesteryear. I am your host, Derek M. Cook, and welcome to the show. Now, if you missed it, a couple of days ago in part one of our discussion about the movie, Paul and I broke down some pretty important elements about I Walked with a Zombie. No, we didn't just do a beat-by-beat breakdown about the plot. Guys, gals, you need to see the movie for that. And it's just over an hour long, so you've got no excuse. In part two of our discussion, we're going to talk a little bit more about the movie, but we're also going to talk about voodoo films, which is another area of expertise for Paul. We're going to talk about other voodoo movies, including another zombie movie that I happen to really like. And then we kind of go all over the place, and it's a great discussion. We talk about black exploitation films. We talk about remakes. We talk about we just talk about a lot, and you're going to have to listen to the rest of our conversation later in this episode to hear it all. Now, you can find Paul at his website at paulmccomas.com, or you can follow the link in the show notes over at our website at monsterkidradio.net. Also at our website, you can find links to our Live 365 page, our YouTube page, as well as our contact information. Our email address is monsterkidradio at gmail.com, and our voicemail line is 503 503- 4795MKR. If you have any thoughts about anything that we've talked about on the show or any suggestions for things you want to hear us talk about in the future, drop me a line. You'll also find a link to the band Guantanamo Baywatch. It's their song, Barbacoa, that opened this show, and you'll hear that song in its entirety at the end of this episode, or you can just pick it up off their album, Chest Crawl. You can find out more about them at guantanamobaywatch.com, or again, follow the link in the show notes. Now, I promised you a couple of days ago in episode 48, I was going to remind everybody how they can enter to win an original piece of artwork from sculptor, previous guest of Monster Kid Radio, and all-around good guy, Tom Beagler. Now, he has created a diorama, two silicates from the movie Island of Terror that we talked about here on the show in episodes 44 and 45 earlier this month. If you go back to those episodes and look at the episode image that appears on our website or when you download the show, it's actually the image that appears when you're playing it on your MP3 player, you can see the original artwork. Tom has donated this original sculpt to the show, and we want to offer you an opportunity to win this original piece of artwork. Here's how you enter. Email me at monsterkidradio at gmail.com, your name, your mailing address, and then the name of a movie that's been released within the past 10 years that you think is Monster Kid friendly. Obviously, a lot of horror movies over the past several years Probably don't have that Monster Kid aesthetic. However, there have been some, and as evidenced by the entries that I've gotten so far, there are some that I haven't even considered. So go ahead and email me your name, address, name of a movie at monsterkidradio at gmail.com. I will put all the entries into a drawing, and in December we'll announce the winner. Now, the deadline for this contest, for the original sculpt of two, well, actually, I guess technically it's two and a half silicates from the movie Island of Terror, starring Peter Cushing, directed by Terrence Fisher is November 30th. I'll remind everybody about the 50 review challenge that we've got going on at the end of this episode after we finish speaking with Paul McComas about I Walked with a Zombie and a whole bunch of other stuff right after this. Hammer Film Productions began in 1934, and after producing almost 200 films and television programs, the studio is still releasing and re-releasing new and classic film titles. 1951 Down Place is the podcast that brings you the story of the great Hammer films, one movie at a time. Here are your hosts describing what Hammer means to them. First is Casey. Hammer means the beautiful and glamorous women of Hammer Horror, the engaging storytelling, and amazing period films. Joining him is Derek. Hammer means the incredible work of actors like Peter Cushing, Christopher Lee, and even Michael Ripper. The gothic storytelling, the incredible music, and the set pieces. And finally, here's Scott. Hammer? Wasn't that an 80s cop show on ABC with David Raish? This boy has a lot to learn. Join our hosts as they make their journey through the Hammer Films catalogue and discuss each film with critical opinion, historical facts, production notes and other information about these classic films. 1951 Down Place can be found in iTunes or their website, www.hammerfilms.com. 
1951downplace.com. Wait, that was Sledgehammer. 1951downplace, the home of Hammer Films discussion. When we had you on the show before, this came up, and obviously we're talking about it now. What is it about voodoo in cinema that has intrigued you so much? Because you've seen a lot of these types of movies. Yeah, I've been disappointed more often than not. Although, I, you know, I can enjoy it on the pure exploitation level. I really like a movie like Weird Woman, getting back to the chain oh, yeah. canon. Really like And I have, I've created a term. I call these faux-do, which is faux-voodoo. <laughs> okay, so Weird like Woman is, is a faux-do movie. Cult of the Cobra is a faux-do movie, and one with significant sociocultural uh, subtext. Just very briefly, Cult of the Cobra, you know, these American GIs, they go to this exotic ceremony, and they are explicitly instructed to be respectful and not to take pictures. And so what do they do? They take pictures, you know? Mm -hmm. And and the Cobra comes back to the United States and, and takes them out one by one because they've violated the sanctity of that ceremony. You know, I, I'm always rooting for the Cobra lady in that movie. Um, <laughs> but that's a faux-do movie. And just the notion of um, sympathetic magic. Sy- sympathetic magic is very cinematic. The scenes when I walked with the zombie with the doll, you know, um, and then we, we cut back and forth between what the voodooists are doing with the doll of Jessica to what's happening with real Jessica in real time. I just saw the Cat's Paw episode of Star Trek last night on, on MeTV, and that's all about sympathetic magic, too. And it, I think there's a reason why it's shown up in so many cultures. It's probably a part of our Jungian collective unconscious, this notion that if you create a miniature version of something and do the right spells and incantations, you can have some impact on the, the original I've just always been really intrigued by voodoo since I was about 11 and the family went to New Orleans and I toured the voodoo museum and started learning about Marie Laveau. I'm still waiting for someone to do the Marie Laveau movie. I know she's being used as a kind of a supporting character in this season of American Horror Story, but not authentically and and not realistically. The real story of Marie Laveau is so much more interesting than than any kind of uh, exaggerated uh, oversimplification that can be done for shock value. In the time of slavery, she was a free woman and probably probably the most powerful woman in the United States at that time. She would show up uh, in court. She'd been hired to and sit on one side or the other. And if she was you know, siding with the defense, the judge would rule that way. And if she was siding with the prosecution, the judge would rule that way for fear of his own life. She had been a hairdresser, and she listened to everything that people said, and then she'd come forth with these pronouncements. And how did she know that? She must be mystical. Well, maybe she was mystical, but she was also really smart and paying attention all the time. Uh, No one hears more than the hairdresser or the barber. So she did seem to know things that there was no way for, for her to be able to know. So as a kid, I was probably drawn into the voodoo stuff initially by the cool surface aspects of it in, in some of the movies that we've all seen. But then when I like buy a, a book at the Voodoo Museum about the history of voodoo in New Orleans or the history of Marie Laveau and start to read it, wow, there were all these other cool levels to voodoo beyond what we see on the screen. And then in college, I was taking an anthropology of religion course and decided to do my paper for it on kind of compare and contrast the voodoo of Haiti and the voodoo of New Orleans, which I called hoodoo with an H because it's an Americanization of the word voodoo and it was an easier way to kind of distinguish between the two. Voodoo, Haitian style, is extremely sophisticated theology and practice, whereas hoodoo, once it reaches New Orleans, it becomes much more practical magic, much more about the casting of spells and hexes, not necessarily uh, to hurt people, more often to help and to guarantee health and protection and that kind of thing. But uh, some of the sophistication dropped away. I think it got lost in the translation. Uh, American New Orleans style voodoo is, uh, or hoodoo is, is a, a little bit of a Xerox copy and, and some of the cooler details of it have sort of faded away. Well, at least they've got her as a hairdresser on American Horror Story. I mean, at least that's yeah. probably right. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't yeah. know if that was intentional or are they just kind of lucked into that, but yeah. Oh, no, it's intentional. They're, they're definitely using some of the actual historical Marie Laveau. In this case, the true story is such an interesting one. I would love to see Angela Bassett playing the real-life Marie Laveau with, without 
all of the kind of over the top inventions that American Horror Story is is adding to the mix. Oh boy, yeah. I mean, my my first experience with anything regarding Mary Laveau was reading about her in Doctor Strange comic books, not mm-hmm. really realizing that she was a real person and that sort of right. thing. So, I mean, right. obviously from there I kind of branched out and learned more. But yeah, and and she was the first of two. There was Marie the second, her daughter, mm-hmm. who who took over upon Marie's death. And uh, to this day, I mean, I've been to their graves in the St. Louis Cemetery in New Orleans. To this day, every single day, people go up and lean pennies against those tombs or draw an X on them with a red stone and and ask for favors. There are still an awful lot of people um, in New Orleans who who communicate with Marie and her daughter uh, on a regular basis. Other than I Walked with a Zombie, what are some other, I don't know, good voodoo representations of voodoo in film i i, I yeah. can't think of many myself but oh they're few and far between they really are they tend to veer towards the exploitative and voodoo as some version of satanism which which is ridiculous voodoo comes half from catholicism and half from african yeah. african religions yeah i mean they've got their loa their their whole network of gods and many of the catholic saints show up in that network of loa is it polytheistic no more so than Roman Catholicism. If Roman Catholicism is polytheistic, then so is voodoo. And, and if Catholicism is not, then na- neither is voodoo. As I understand it, it emerged in Haiti after Protestant missionaries had attempted to convert the so-called heathen. The Catholics were a little more canny about it and said, you can hang on to what you believe, but why don't you believe in this too? And voodoo is what emerged from that synthesis. So talk about living in two worlds Mm -hmm. and talk about limbo and talk about suspension between two realities. Voodoo is that inherently. Well, and even in this movie, there's that moment where the little boy is seeing (laughs) uh, the mother and she's like, how are you going to get into heaven if you've got one foot in the voodoo still, you know? That's right. As if they're mutually exclusive. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Other good voodoo movies, you know... (laughs) I could talk about some good photo movies, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, to my mind, unless I've missed something, this is the good voodoo movie. Okay, you know what? I'll give you one more. Okay. <laughs> and that's the black exploitation film Sugar Hill. Yes, I love Sugar Hill. Yeah. Probably for all the yeah. wrong reasons, but I love Sugar Hill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not as, as authentic to true voodoo as I Walked with a Zombie is, but it gets some things right. You know, and, and I love uh, Baron Samdi, the trickster, the way he's mm-hmm. portrayed in the film. I love that Sugar uses the zombie army as a force for good, at least from her point of view and from my point of view watching it. She's using them to avenge the killing of her lover by the white run drug ring and to take down the white run drug ring. Yeah, in a weird way, despite the. <laughs> cobweb-covered zombies rising from their graves with machetes. <laughs> They're a force for good, Yeah, <laughs> actually. Yeah, and, and actually, and since we've gone uh, that far, there's another black exploitation film, Scream, Blackula Scream, that is a pretty decent voodoo movie. It's hmm. the, the second of the two Blackula films with William Marshall. I haven't seen and that in this, years. This, this one takes place in New Orleans, and it's got a significant voodoo element. And certainly it handles voodoo better than, say, Live and Let Die does. You know? <laughs> because at least the black exploitation films, they're from a black point of view. Uh-huh. So you're not going to get the same kind of denigration and insult to voodoo that you do from something like a Bond film. But there's a big gap between I Walked with a Zombie at the top of the Pantheon and uh, you go down a ways and you get to Sugar Hill. Yeah. Um, there's, <laughs> there's just not, not anything that I can think of in between. I was really disappointed in The Serpent and the Rainbow when I heard that it, they were turning the book into a movie. Well, but then, I, wasn't it a George Romero film? So you oh, know West it's Craven. going to... Wes Craven. Oh, Wes Craven. That's right. That's right. It's a Wes Craven, Craven film. And so you know that it's going to go towards the shock and away from the nuance. I, I mean, I liked Nightmare on Elm Street, and I, I like some of what Craven has done. I just wish sometimes that people would, like Turner did and, and uh, the screenwriters, stick a little bit closer to real voodoo because you don't really have to distort it to make it interesting. It's, it's inherently really interesting. Now, the word is Wade Davis was not overly pleased with the final result. Of yeah. the Serpent in the Rainbow. Yeah, I imagine not. Now, have you seen 
Oh, God. I'm going to bring it up, and by even talking about it, I give it power. The 2002 remake of I Walked with a Zombie, Ritual. Oh, my God. I was not aware that anyone had tried to remake I Walked with a Zombie. That the be... people behind the Tales from the Crypt TV show, oh, great. it was to be the third in their theatrical run of Tales from the Crypt films, but because the second one of that series bombed so badly, it got shelved. Somebody else picked up the rights, released it, stripping the Crypt Keeper introduction out of it. <laughs> uh, when it was released to DVD, the Crypt Keeper stuff was put back in, and you know he's sitting there in the dreads at a poolside in Jamaica or whatever, or Haiti, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, Jennifer so, Grey plays the nurse in that. Okay. And so did they screw it up royally, I'm guessing? There is not a lot of subtlety. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, um, do, any, do any zombies commit murders in it? You know, I saw it once. Yeah. I saw it once when I covered it on my old podcast, and I haven't seen it since. I yeah. do remember the cast was interesting. Jennifer Grey, Craig Sheffer, Tim Curry pops up. Hmm. But... Yeah, Some movies just don't need to be remade. I, I would know? argue that most don't need to be remade. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could see it uh, in some cases. There's been talk about remaking Soylent Green. I think that that Ooh. would be worth doing in part because they had to work on such a low budget and bring a whole world of the future to life on such a low budget. They did a great job with what they had. But um, I would love to see that remade. Carrie was remade by a really good director. Uh, Kimberly Pierce, who directorial debut, Boys Don't Cry. I can't think of a better directorial debut in recent years. Did you see the new Carrie? No, it was on our list, and we just never got around to it. You know, because Kimberly Pierce is a feminist, I was expecting a pretty significant re-envisioning of Carrie. And I was looking forward to one, honestly, because, you know, the original is the original, and it's great, and we love it, and and now let's do something new and different with this material. But she did essentially a a remake of of De Palma's movie, rather than saying, what else can I do with the the Stephen King source material and, and put my own vision on it? So... I don't know. I, I suppose remake I Walk with the Zombie if you're going to be even more racially responsible and even more uh, to the point about what Turner was doing. But if what they did was turn it into a run-of-the-mill genre film, then that's a real mistake. Because when I get ready to teach this film, people always roll their eyes when I mention the title. It is, sounds like an exploitation film. It does. It's got yeah. that title. Yeah, but. Um, and I tell them it's. Not, I, I tell them flat out, this is not a horror movie. You know, I can call it many things. It's a psycho spiritual thriller. It's a psycho sexual drama. It's about the legacy of slavery, but it, it's not really a horror movie to me because the figure, the character that you would assume would be the object of horror, Carrefour, doesn't hurt anybody, and is more of a conscience than anything else in this film. So. I mean, do you consider I Walked with a Zombie to be a horror film? You know, a lot of movies that I think get called horror movies, especially from the 40s, I I see them getting the horror label maybe even now just to help sell them a little bit better. Is it a scary movie? Does it inspire fear? I mean, sure, I'm sure it's got some of that. But no, I don't necessarily put it on the same level in terms of horror as some other of its contemporaries at the time. There's more to it than that. That's not to say I don't think just a straight-up horror movie is worth my time, but there's more to it than just horror movie here. Yeah, you know, it, there's some spooky moments. There's suspense. Oh, yeah. Maybe a, a terror picture, I think, is what Luton would call it. But, mm-hmm. you know, flat-out horror film, I I struggle with that label. Yeah, I would say no, because Cat People is and The Leopard Man is. Those are movies about people getting killed, whereas this is a movie about people being haunted literally and figuratively. And so I I could call it a ghost movie or a ghost story more easily than I could call it a horror film. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. Yeah. What it's doing is more subtle than horror. Uh, And I love Cat People. It's a great film. It's my second favorite Turner film, but it's a horror film in a way that I walk with a zombie is not. Right. Well, and Turner getting away from Luton, like Curse of the Demon or whatever. I mean, that's a horror film, you know, so that's right. Definitely different. You know, yeah, that the remake is terrible. It's, yeah. it's, it's not subtle at all. <laughs> well, for one thing, the remake undoubtedly is in color, and this is a movie that needs to be in black and white for a number of reasons. First of all, it's a movie about blacks and whites, and it's just such a great example of the so-called silver screen, the, the notion that a director of black and white who knows what he's doing, like Turner did, can give you 
not 50 shades of gray, but, but a million shades of gray. <laughs> uh, the uh, Turner's palette yeah. here is just so, so gorgeous and so luminous, particularly on the, the walk through, um, and through the fields and to the home fort for the ceremony. It's such an amazing scene. It's six and a half minutes, basically, um, without dialogue in a 69-minute movie. You've got about a tenth of the running time there right after the middle taken up in, in this just uh, tone poem, which for me kind of calls to mind the filmmaker Maya Darren, who was um, also working in the 40s. She did a, a short film called Meshes of the Afternoon that we watched in film school that made a real impact on me such that when I saw I Walked with a Zombie the next time, I saw, oh, okay, that, that some similar approach here to imagery. But you don't need any dialogue in that scene. And, and the sound is so great. The drums come up very slowly in the, in the audio. Betsy and Jessica get closer and closer to the ceremony. You've got the wind blowing through the gourd that has holes in it, giving it this really kind of unearthly tone, and the rustling of the reeds. Then we start to hear the singing at the ceremony. I don't consider that dialogue. It's music. And uh, right up until the moment where uh, Mrs. Rand speaks softly from inside the fort, it's almost seven minutes without dialogue. So it's a little gem of a, of, of a sequence within a masterpiece of a movie. You mentioned the sound and like the gourd and everything else. I'm a film score collector. People who know me know that my iPod is just stuffed to the eye gills with film music. Mm-hmm. I love the music in this. It's by Roy Webb, but yeah. there's not a lot of music in the film. So much of what you would probably assume where film score would go yeah. is sound effect, wind, you know, the voodoo okay. drums, the, the chants, the religious ceremony. The sound is, of the conch being blown, yes, yeah. It's used as if it's some sort of sound, you know, film score, but it's right. not. I mean, it is, but it isn't. Right. And it's some very interesting choices, and I'm not sure who made those choices. I'm I, thinking Tourneur, but it, it, the main theme of the song, musically, it's not any of the romantic themes that get drowned out by drums mm-hmm. when Paul and, and, and Betsy are making eyes at each other. It's the song that the blacks sing, and it's like, oh, 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 and we hear an instrumental version of that over the opening credits, mm-hmm. and then pretty soon we're on the ship that's taking Paul back to the island and Betsy to the island for the first time, and we hear the, the black men as they're having their dinner singing that song, if I'm remembering this correctly. And, and then we hear it at the end, too, during that voiceover. Notice this, a movie that starts with a white woman's voiceover ends with a black man's voiceover, right? Ah, uh, yeah, good point. Yeah, and I'm not a huge fan of the voiceover because I think that it sort of limits one's interpretation of those events at the end. The woman was a wicked woman, you know? <laughs> well, <laughs> slavery was a wicked system, more to the point. But I do like the last thing he says, pity them who are dead and give peace and happiness to the living. It's a little blessing, you know, at the end of this movie about suffering, struggling, haunted, suspended people. There's this blessing, and the meaning of that to me is that perhaps now that the half-dead Jessica has been made fully dead and her lover has died with her, maybe everyone can start to live again. Maybe... Paul and Betsy can leave this island and Mrs. Rand too and go back to their world and stop co-opting uh, the, the world of these other people and they can move forward with their lives, maybe Betsy and Paul as a, as a couple. And Alma and the other blacks on St. Sebastian can begin to run their own world for a change and not be a permanent servant class. Pity them who are dead. Pity Jessica. Pity Wes. And give peace and happiness to the living in their two worlds. What were we talking about originally that got me? <laughs> uh, oh, oh, the sound, the, the yeah, sound, yeah. yeah. So the, that song, that kind of um, melancholy, mournful, dirge-like song that uh, becomes the main theme instrumentally at the beginning and the end, and then we see its source just a few minutes into the movie that is something that is native to the, the blacks of St. Sebastian. It's a great film. It's yeah. easily available. It's available as part of a box set of other Val Luton films, which comes with a great documentary narrated by Martin Scorsese about Val Luton. So, I mean, it's easy to get your hands on. There is no reason why people can't sit down and spend an hour or so with this film. I think it's something that's – I'd call it required viewing. I mean, if you're a zombie fan, if you're a voodoo fan, if you're a monster kid, I would call it required viewing. If you're a viewing. film buff, if you're yeah. a film fan, if you like cinema, I can't 
really think of a better use of film to evoke mood and atmosphere. I really can't. Don't let the you word know. zombie scare you off because it's <laughs> it's very, you know, the zombie presence is very li- well, very little or literal depending on your point of view. So. Or you can play Count the Zombie, like I said, and, there you, and go. you know, uh, you've got two pretty standard issue zombies in Carrefour and, and Jessica, <laughs> but then you've got em- emotional zombies in Wes and Mrs. Rand, and to some extent Paul. Um, a part of each of them has died. They are the Walking Dead. Uh, in a sense. And speaking of zombies, you know, you younger people don't go expecting cannibalism. No, not at all. Um, <laughs> no zombies harm anyone in this movie. Zombies rather are, are the result of people having been harmed by an illicit relationship in one case, by uh, an evil system of um, subjugation in another. These are not George Romero's zombies. Um, not at all. Yeah, yeah I, I, mean, I, I, I like Romero's zombies. Sure. I I especially like Dawn of the Dead, the original Dawn of the Dead, which I think has a lot to say about consumer culture, <laughs> literally consumer <Yeah>. culture. <laughs> <laughs> Setting it in a mall was brilliant. Having them stumble about to the accompaniment of music and the sound system is <laughs> brilliant and hilarious. I love that sequence. Yes. But no, these are not your Romero and, and after zombies. Uh, this this goes back to a time when that, that word had not been... Um, uh, kind of reconfigured to mean masses of cannibalistic, apocalyptic walking dead. It, it, huh. It's at a time when zombie still was part of the voodoo mm-hmm. uh, canon. Yeah. yeah, talk about your loss of identity there, how zombie, yeah. <laughs> the word zombie got co-opted. And, you yeah. know, no disrespect, yeah. no disrespect. I wouldn't have done a five-year run of my other zombie podcast <laughs> if I didn't love some of those, these other, you know, more, oh, more yeah. zombies. But yeah. Yeah. even during the run of that podcast, I always said, and I still believe that to this day, I really wish there were more voodoo-style zombie films. Mm-hmm. I wish yeah. there were more supernatural zombie stories out there. And, you know, I get my fix in things like White Zombie or I Walk with a Zombie or the sequel, Zombies on Broadway, right? <laughs> starring, starring Darby Jones as a zombie, so I guess it is a kind of sequel. Yeah, Mr. Lancelot show up in that one too. <laughs> but see, I I'm kidding. It's not I, a sequel. I, I, <laughs> there, there are some, there are some nice stylistic touches to uh, White Zombie, and of course, we all love Lugosi. But I really, I really put I Walk with a Zombie in a whole other category than White Zombie because it's hard to see voodoo in white zombie as anything other than a force for evil right that's a good point that's a really good yeah point. yeah whereas it is largely a force for good and i walked with a zombie that's a really good point i would put them at the very top if i were to pick my favorite pre-romero zombie films it's those two right there yeah you know i walk with a zombie and white zombie now last week on monster kid radio we had steve sullivan on talking about his novelization of white zombie yeah so you know go back and listen to that if you're interested in hearing a little bit more about that but you know, I loved having Paul on to talk about I Walked with a Zombie this week on Monster Kid Radio. You know, he mentioned it when we had him on the show before. He loved the voodoo films. And I, I think uh, I learned something. <laughs> <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't get to just chat about a movie, which I'm all about doing. But when I have Paul on the show, I'm always taking notes. Oh, <laughs> you're very kind. You're very kind. White Zombie is a better movie than Sugar Hill, but Sugar Hill is a better voodoo movie. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> hey, I love Sugar Hill, too. <laughs> now, we didn't talk about this at the very beginning because we dove right into I Walked with a Zombie. Yeah. But uh, since the last time we had you on the show, your book has won an award. Can we talk about that real quick? Oh, sure. Thank you. Yeah, twist my arm. I'll mention that. So the Halloween Book Festival is held annually for genre books, and uh, it's operated by JM Northern Media of Hollywood, California. Yeah, I found out last month that uh, Fit for a Frankenstein, my novella co-authored with Greg Sturette, that takes place within the uh, Ghost of Frankenstein timeline, actually, and explains how the monster got his new suit before arriving at Viseria and how the monster and Igor got to Viseria. So it took the uh, top prize in the fan fiction category, and uh, my prior book, Unforgettable Harrowing Futures, Horrors and Dark Humor, took the top prize in uh, Alternate Futures category. So two Halloween Book Festival awards in 23 competition for two different books. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be getting the little gold seals that I can stick on the covers. <laughs> well, congratulations on that. I, Thank I, you. You know, I still stand by it. I loved Fit for a Frankenstein, and Thanks. listeners can check it out over at your website at paulmccamas.com. There will be a link in the show notes, uh, of course, over at monsterkidradio.net. It's also available as a – it is an ebook, right? I think – Yes. 
It's available as both hard copy and ebook. And actually, if you go to my website and go to news, there's a link where you can see my co-author Greg and I uh, as Igor and the Taylor actually uh, acting out a scene from Fit for a Frankenstein at the monthly uh, reading series in Chicago. I've watched the video. Oh, good. It's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I had to channel my inner David Hyde Pierce uh, <laughs> to, to get the fastidious tailor just right, and I think Greg did a great job with uh, with Igor. Oh, he did. He channeled Lugosi yeah. just fine. <laughs> yeah. I loved it. <laughs> well, again, Paul, thank you. Got anything new coming up? Uh, yeah, it looks like 2014 is probably going to be the year that Logan's Journey, the Logan novel that uh, Logan's run author William F. Nolan and I co-authored, is going to be coming out. And uh, fingers crossed, it looks like it might come out first as a, an audio book, hopefully, hopefully read by uh, Jenny Agater. That's what we're shooting for. Wow. Yeah. Well, that'll be very cool. Fingers and everything else crossed then. Yeah. Much everything success. we have two uh, of, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And if you know any voodoo chants or anything that might help. Um, Eshibarako, Moshiba. Yeah, all right. I'll work, I'll work my voodoo chant, yeah. There we go. There we go. Well, Paul, thanks again, man. Thank you, Derek. Always a pleasure. And uh, stay on the right side of uh, Dumbala, okay? <laughs> Will do. Okay. Take care. I cannot stress enough two things. One, if you have not seen I Walk With a Zombie, you need to. It's a fantastic film. And two... Thank you to Paul McComas for coming back to Monster Kid Radio to talk about this movie. We are planning to have him back again at the end of our conversation after I stopped recording. He and I were talking a little bit, and we came up with what our next topic will be the next time I have him on the show. So stay tuned for more Paul McComas, and stay tuned for new episodes of Monster Kid Radio. Next week is episode 50. We're hitting the big 5 on Tuesday of next week. That'll be dropping into your iTunes and however else you download or listen to the show on November 26th. I'm going to have Scott and Tracy Morris back on the show. They spent an incredible two days at the historic Artcraft Theater in Franklin, Indiana for a six movie, 35 millimeter print run of some original Universal Monster movies. And some of these movies are movies that they had never seen. So they're going to tell us a little bit about the event. And then we're going to talk about these movies that are leaving an impression on these two for the very first time. I'm excited to share that with everybody next week. Now, while I am planning a special feedback episode, I did get an email that I wanted to respond to quickly from Larry C. He sent me the following question by email. Derek, how about a review of the movie Goonies? So here's the thing. I love Goonies. I live in Oregon, and I can't be an Oregonian without loving the movie Goonies since it was shot here. Although you might need to take a corner off my Oregonian geek card because I've never been to Astoria where they shot the film, or at least not to look around. I really need to check that off my bucket list. As far as covering the movie here on Monster Kid Radio, while it's a fun movie and it's something that I really do enjoy and watched over and over and over again when it came out on video... I don't know if it necessarily fits the Monster Kid Radio aesthetic. You know, on Monster Kid Radio, we, we cover a very specific type of film. And one of those qualifiers is that the movie came out during the classic era of monster movies. And just to kind of peel the curtain back a little bit, when I look at movies to cover here on the show, I typically go from, well, the birth of cinema to around 1968, because that's when Night of the Living Dead came out and kind of changed horror cinema forever. Now, The Exorcist really kind of put the lid on the classic era for me anyway. That's not to say I don't like those movies. I love them. But as far as what we do here on Monster Kid Radio, we really try to stick within that era That said, we may every once in a while get outside of that era because there are some movies that I want to talk about on Monster Kid Radio that are incredibly relevant, like Matinee or The Monster Squad, and eventually we'll talk about those movies. Or if there's a monster movie from the 70s that features people that are known for their Monster Kid movies, like John Carradine or Lon Chaney Jr., specifically I'm thinking of Horror of the Blood Monsters or Dracula vs. Frankenstein, yeah, I'll cover those here too. On top of that, I'm planning a special series of episodes devoted to some topics that would still be relevant while still holding on to those Monster Kid trappings. 
Is that the best way to put it? I'm also planning some other things down the line that might kind of branch out from that. And that's not to say that I won't do a Goonie special, especially if I ever do get around to visiting Astoria, Oregon and checking out the locations for the Goonies. Because, man, like I said, I love that movie. And that's one of the tapes that I probably wore down to the videotape magnetic threads, playing it over and over and over again in our old beta machine growing up. And speaking of correspondence that I've received from some of our listeners, we also received a message from Joe Badon. He is involved in a Kickstarter project that I wanted to mention here on the show. The Kickstarter project is a comic anthology called Memoirs of the Mysterious. So here's why it's important and why I wanted to talk about it here on Monster Kid Radio. One, Joe Badon's a good friend of the show. Two, Joe Badon is not the only Monster Kid Radio listener who's involved in this project. This is a digital comic, and each story is introduced... By Dr. Gane Green. That's right. Larry Underwood, who's been here on the show before, is presenting each of the stories in the Memoirs of the Mysterious comic. The graphic novel is in the vein of The Twilight Zone, The Outer Limits, and EC Comics. So that's right up Monster Kid Radio's alley. I wanted to share that with everybody. There will be a link to this Kickstarter page in the show notes. When this episode goes out, there will be 22 days left in the Kickstarter. Now, they're only trying to get to $1,000. That's all they need. They still need your help to make this project a reality. Go help Joe. Go help Larry. And go help all the future readers of Memoirs of the Mysterious because it just looks cool. And finally, our 50 review challenge. I know people can listen to the show through Stitcher on their smartphone. And I know people can download the show from our website, play it on their computer, various MP3 players or whatever. But if you download the show through iTunes, I'm going to ask that you spend 30 seconds and go leave us a review in the iTunes store. Here's the deal. If we get to 50 honest reviews in the iTunes store, I'm launching a new special Monster Kid Radio spinoff show. It will have a monthly release schedule. It will be about a very specific topic within the Monster Kid Radio wheelhouse proper, and I'm excited to get this going. So please, if you haven't already done so, consider dropping us a review. As of this recording, we still have 24 reviews, and I appreciate every single one of them, and I've read every single one of them, and have taken everything to heart, the good and the critical. And I I really appreciate all the honest feedback about the show. So please leave us an honest review in the iTunes store if you haven't already done so and you're an iTunes user. Once we hit 35 reviews, I will announce what this special spin-off show will be. Monster Kid Radio is a registered service mark of Monster Kid Radio, LLC. All original content of Monster Kid Radio by Monster Kid Radio, LLC is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivations, 3.0 unported license. Of course, that does not apply to the song Barbacoa. That belongs to Guantanamo Baywatch. It can be found on their album Chest Crawl, and it appears in this episode of Monster Kid Radio with their permission. Talk to you next week for episode 50. (laughs) 